and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Slightly Reckless Games, creators of the upcoming Morkborg hack known as Ronin, the one and only Sasha Lightfoot. How are you doing today, man? Hello. Uh, thank you for having me. I don't think I can uh, quite match that energy, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Everybody, th everybody thinks that that I'm, that I'm on coffee when I do that, but no, I don't even like I don't even like coffee, and well, because of some of my stunts, nobody's gonna trust me with coffee. That and the whole getting. Oh, you just switched it on as well. It was good. Mm -hmm. Oh, that and the whole getting kicked out of a Starbucks. One that one, one that got replaced with a tanning booth a few months later. So karma is a beautiful thing. But, yeah, you win that one. Yeah. But I usually start with the humble beginnings, in the, in a sense. So walk mm -hmm. me through your introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Uh, so around, I'd say probably just over 10 years ago now, we had a friend who just said one day, oh, do you want to play Dungeons & Dragons? He DM'd a few times before, and I think, like... Back then, certainly, before all the kind of, like, it's, it's quite a popular medium now, isn't it? But especially in the UK, it was kind of like, I thought it was a board game, something like that. Um, so I just had this kind of, like, image of, you know, the classic people in the basement, you know, with little little miniatures and stuff like that. And then we all went around to his house to play and we just, like, instantly hooked. It was like a, a big improv session of, like, I, it's some TTRPG sessions. I've never laughed as much. Uh, as like you know, just in normal social interactions, because it's just, it's just fantastic. Um, so we played that for a little bit. We had a campaign that I eventually ruined as a player, but I, I kind of don't take too much of the blame for that one because the DM gave gave the party an item that could kind of like change anything into anything, and I uh, chased down the the big bad in the middle of the campaign and turned him into a swarm of bees, and that was kind of like amazing at the time in the session but then everyone had this kind of like sad after reaction of like oh well that's that's over then so then we decided to um start up a new campaign with a different group and that was good and then i started looking into kind of other games that weren't D D 5e and i found cyberpunk 2020 by art halsorian um so i started dming that and then i started kind of fiddling with that rule system and changing stuff and then cyberpunk red came out so i started to dm that and then um kind of early last year i discovered um free league publishing mm -hmm. and obviously i got into the alien game and ran that and that was amazing and then the blade runner game was was also great um so i just started think like i started looking into free league's catalog of of stuff and then obviously found the, the iconic Morkborg and started to go down that rabbit hole and, you know, looking at Vaskrim and Pirate Borg and Frontier Scum and I've kind of ran all of those and went, you know, I started to have ideas about where it where it could go and what kind of kind of a spin we could do on it. And and then my initial idea, because I was reading Neil Gaiman's um, Norse mythology at the time, was to do kind of a Norse thing around the gods and the kind of like lesser known capers um but i kind of sat on that for a little bit and then my kind of i, I work in video production so i've got kind of like a not an encyclopedia uh, encyclopedic but like a good knowledge of films and stuff like that and I've, I've always loved like kurosawa and those old kind of samurai films and stuff like that so mm -hmm. kind of light bulb went off in my head and then i started to write ronin and up to where we are now it's uh it's been a wild ride. Yep. And now, as I as I understand it, the the principal setup with Ro with Ronin is it taking place in the island of Kage no Shima, which is under this yes. under this eclipse, and because of that, yokai are 
all all all, all over the place, but people are com people are coming in to get some sort of some sort of redemption for themselves. Um yeah, so Kaganoshima is kind of like a a fictional island and and the Ronin's kind of set during the Edo period. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, the, there's a something's brought about this endless eclipse and the eclipse has kind of brought around yokai and demons. So we've got like a good selection of of uh monsters and stuff and then the honor system kind of encourages this like the people of Kaginoshima haven't lost her all hope kind of in the, the Mortborg sense of like you know in Mortborg I think everyone just knows it's fucked and, and that's they just deal with it whereas the people of Kaginoshima are a, a little bit more hopeful and, and they're kind of clinging on to their, their ideas of honor and redemption and stuff like that like you say mm -hmm. and yeah, Speaking of speaking of that, how if you had if you had to venture a guess, how large would you say Kage no Shima is, or is it a case where the actual size is isn't is hard is hard to say because of the fact that it hasn't that there is whole swaths of it that haven't been mapped? Um, I wouldn't like to put like a, a numeric value on it, like um, you know, like in, in terms of like miles or or uh, kilometers or something like that, but it's certainly like. Um, I was saying the other day that like J Japan's kind of like a really good place to to set a game in because the way the island's structured, you've got like Hokkaido at the north where it's all kind of like wintry and stuff like that, and then you go all the way down to Okinawa and there's like beaches and almost like jungles and stuff like that. So you've got kind of a lot of um, like a broad set of biomes that you can work in. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you if you've played Ghost of Tsushima, but it's kind oh, of yeah. like. <laughs> Similar, yeah, similar to that in the same of in, in the sense of um, kind of scope and and um, size. Yeah, I, I do. Th I do look at it as a bit of validation that, for for one, even Japanese developers ha had had have had nothing but praise for Ghost of Tsushima, but also that Sucker Punch has become ambassadors to Tsushima yeah, Island. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. It's fantastic. I think I think one of the people who ended up praising it is the director of um, Ryuga Gotoku. Okay. Um, also, also known as the Yakuza series. Oh yeah, yeah. I, you know what? I hadn't like um, I hadn't played a Yakuza game until like a Dragon came out, and I played a little bit of that, and then I kind of like didn't gel with it straight away. But I thought it was okay. But then I played like a Dragonition. Um, when it came out recently, the remastered version, and pretty much finished it in a few days. It was uh, like a really cool look at that time period, um, which kind of like also nudged me towards the the Edo period because a lot of people were like, you know, why don't you set it during Sengoku Jidai? Um, Sengoku Jidai I, I is like, honestly overexposed. It's, I'd say, I, yeah, I'd I say agree. It's about as it's about as overexposed as um, doing as doing a story in say over here in the states in the American Civil War because there's no shortage of reenactors all over the damn country. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd I'd say I'd say similar similar cases would be the the hundred years the hundred years war in part in parts of Europe or. I think what would be a good ex what would be a good example of a historical period that's just overexposed in in media in the U in the UK. Well, World War Two for sure. Yeah, um, although ad admittedly, I do th I do think that Weird War Two is a little bit um, underexplored. Right. No, um, taking the World War Two aesthetic and adding and adding something and adding something a bit ri a bit ridiculous. Whether it, whether it be the times that Hellboy ventures into World War Two or um, the t or the times that or st or even TTRPGs like Lightning War, which is doing a um, World War Two approach in the in a fantasy setting. Oh, that's cool. Uh, but yeah, I'd say two periods. That, there's two periods that have shown up briefly in in. In ja in Japanese history in in media, but not but nowhere near enough as um, Sengoku. Edo is definitely yeah. one of them, 
I'd say an I'd say another one is the Heian period. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I guess th- those plus the plus there's also the fact that if you were to set it in the in the Sengoku Jidai, a lot of the su- a lot of the supernatural stuff you'd kind of get cut off from. You'd yeah. you'd e- you'd end up having to focus primarily on the primarily on the war and the vibe I'm getting from Ronin is that you is leaning far more into the str- the strange and su- and supernatural end of things. Absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah. It's um, someone I was talking to someone about it the other day at, uh, when the Sengoku thing was brought up. That I kind of like, I like the idea that the samurai are kind of not on the way out, but kind of not regarded as this, you know, military thing anymore. It's more of this: the samurai are kind of left out, left over from that period, looking for how do they kind of fit into society, and then when you introduce that kind of mystical and, you know, the yokai and stuff like that, it's kind of gives them a little bit of a purpose and it gives the characters in the game a little bit of purpose too. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that, you have six classes that you're introducing with Ronin, but before I get into that, um, one question that I have mm-hmm. is, now, this is described as a, as a Morkborg hack. Because of that, could someone, yeah. run, could someone reasonably run it without having... Any book, any uh, Morkborg book, just with Ronin on its own. Oh yeah, Ronin uh, it is definitely a standalone. You don't you don't need Morkborg to to play Ronin. Uh, obviously, we would recommend picking a copy up because it's a it's good fun and it's a great game. Um, but yeah, no, Ronin's a, a standalone thing. You can you can pick it up, you get the book, and uh, you can just start a session with what's in there already. Mm-hmm. Ah. Uh. Now, getting back to the classes, as me- as mentioned before, there's there's six that are present. Oh. Currently, then, yes, um, it, we reached the stretch goal the other day to add some more. Um, that'll include stuff like Kensei and Yamabushi and other ideas that I've kind of got and already kind of planned out. Mm-hmm. But well, we have six six core ones at the moment. Though, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll get to the stretch goal ones in a moment. I'd like. I'd like to go through them and just get just get a feel for the, for their play style as well as as well as some notes on their um, honor tenets because yeah. it, it definitely feels that that's going to be a thing where each one each class has its own um, its own interpretation of honor. Yes, yes, hundred percent. Yeah. So I'll start. Of, I'll start, of course, with samurai. Yes. Um... The erudite samurai is kind of like I, I liked the idea of going in kind of a different direction. We've obviously got the the Ron, the forgotten Ronin in there as um, kind of like a masterless, but like the the samurai is all all of the kind of class abilities and stuff are, are focused on like knowledge and and studying and um, that kind of thing. They are still a badass. But it's kind of just like a, a little bit more of a different take on it, and obviously the on a tenant side Bushido. Mm-hmm. And when when it comes to the when it comes to the Ronin, um, what sort what sort of approach do you ha- what sort of approach do you have when it comes to them? The witch, sorry. Uh, when it comes to the forgotten Ronin. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... In Kagi no Shima, the Ronin are kind of like there's a, a group called the Ronin Brotherhood, and they all kind of work as like mercenaries and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but their creed is kind of more in the their honor tenets are called the Ronin's Creed, and they're kind of based on uh, Miyamoto Musashi. So there's stuff around like personal mastery and and self sacrifice and stuff like that, and the pursuit of of becoming the best kind of Ronin that you can become. Mm-hmm. Uh, and drunken monk. Um, what could you tell me about their uh, approach? I think like someone asked me the other day if what if I had a favorite class, and I obviously kind of gave the very uh, political answer of like they're all kind of they're good in their own way. But I think if I had to choose one, it probably would be the drunken monk, just because 
I, like someone someone brought up to me was like oh it feels a little bit more like chinese and stuff like that but you know buddhist monks were kind of like certainly a big part of japanese culture in that time period and i kind of like got to have a lot of fun when i was making that character so they've got a, um, a class ability called uh, roadhouse where they can rip someone's throat out they've got um Saki style where they get kind of bonuses in combat when they're under the influence of alcohol so you kind of have to track how much sake you've got and and you know when if it looks like it's going to be a combat encounter you have a swig of, swig of sake for your bonuses and then kind of drunken drunken brawl around mm -hmm. oh and i'm get i'm guessing i'm guessing their tenants are are akin to are akin to Buddhist tenets, although, although given the given the drinking, how how far they go into that is <laughs> subjective. Yeah, well, like uh, I think the the drunken monks' tenets are called the Noble Truths, which is you know obviously heavily uh, inspired by Buddhism. So they have kind of stuff like balance and um, mercy and stuff like that. But the whole kind of point of the game is it's not. You have these tenants, but they're not like a rigid thing of like you have to play this way. You can make decisions that are counterintuitive to those tenants. You'll just lose honor for doing so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not we're not dealing with the lawful stupid conundrum here. <laughs> exactly, like um, the the whole kind of not the inspiration, but when I, after I started kind of coming up with the honor system and and things like that. I, I kind of it's hard not to compare it to the alignment system in D and D, but that kind of for for us anyway, when we used to play it didn't really come up. You know, you might pick your alignment at the beginning of a, a campaign, but everyone kind of just plays chaotic neutral or, or, you know, some version of chaotic anyway. So I wanted something that was like you kind of nudged to play this way and you get bonuses and so, some class abilities will um give you bonuses if your your honor is high enough mm -hmm. um but i wanted to a little bit of throw away at times mm -hmm. so next next up is the onmyo onmyoji oh. onmyoji yeah who I will. I will admit one of my favorite interpretations of the Onmi, of the Onmyoji um, comes from the Japanese tabletop Tenra, um, Tenra Bancho Zero. Where okay, they, I don't think I've heard of that one. Where they, in that in that particular case, they are they are certainly spell they are certainly spell casters, but the spells are through their are through their shikis. Right. Oh, I'm gu I'm guessing that oh, that this take with Onmyoji um st still has them using o using Ofura. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um they have kind of Ofura's the <clears throat> sorry. Uh Ofura's like the main basis of the class. Um they have like access to talismans and stuff, but one thing that I wanted to have with the um Onmyoji was like a lot of the the kind of features that they get, obviously, they get access to the texts and and the our kind of version of spells in the game. But their kind of features are very balanced. So one of the the class of class features is um, shadow binding. So they can bind uh, an enemy to their own shadow. But if they fail the test, then they kind of become stood in in place, which is, you know. It, I didn't want to have too many downsides to the things that they had, but I did want there to be that kind of balance aspect of like, you know, if you're successful, you this will happen, but it kind of like reverses if you if you don't pass that test. Mm -hmm. And I'm and then then the last one of the of the base of the base six is um, Bakuto. Uh, yeah, we've got corrupted Shinobi as well. So Bakuto's kind of like a obviously for anyone who doesn't know it's like a gambler, it's like almost like a precursor to the Yakuza. Mm -hmm. Um they're kind of like your your tavern brawler class. Um we played a session the other day where one of our our players played as one and he had a snake 
that he could he just ended up throwing it at people and that was doing damage but like they're in their own right i've got a lot of um a lot of their class features are based around gambling so uh there's one where you kind of get something similar to lucky where you can re-roll something once a day mm -hmm. um they get something called dirty trick where in combat if you can kind of plead not plead your case but like if you can do something that might like you know distract like throw sand in the face or, or you know kick kick dirt at someone you'll get a little bit of a bonus in, in combat when you're attacking and defending and stuff like that mm -hmm. and their honor tenets are called the gambler's way so it's a lot of like yeah Honor, honor among thieves and like loyalty as long as like you're um you're kind of working to your your own goal for your kind of group per se mm -hmm. uh, given, given that what would the what would the tenets be with the own Muji since we didn't quite get that uh they are the rules of the divine um a lot of kind of stuff that's around like harmony with nature and um, again, it's almost similar to the Drunken Monk, so there's a lot of like being merciful and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But um, kind of things around like not being tied to um, to like worldly or like um, materialistic things. Yeah, and I I could I could definitely see that, especially the whole hermit part of them. Um, yeah, and with the corrupted shinobi. Um, is it a would be would it be a case of of the I guess the best I guess the best way to say is what um what would the tenets be with the corrupted shinobi? I have some guesses, but I'd like to see your like to see what your take is. So the corrupted shinobi has tenets called the unseen virtues. Um, obviously a lot of stuff around like deception and working to your own goals and and stuff like that, but. In in the game, it's kind of on the players to track their tenets and let the the GM know if like obviously the GM will keep track as well. But it's kind of like and the honor system is not just for the character; it's for the player as well. So they can go, oh, you know, I, I stole from that body. That's that's against this tenet or or this aspect of my honor system. Mm -hmm. But the thing with the the corrupted shinobi is the player can. It's the only honest tenant system where the player can lie to the GM about their actions. So, you know, the for example, the, sh the shinobi might do something that is against their tenants, and they then the player has a chance to go, oh, you know, no, I was just doing it for this reason or that reason, and then they can kind of avoid on a loss that way. Um, but that the the unseen virtues are the only tenants that allow a player to to kind of lie to the GM. Mm -hmm. And. You mentioned that there are three, um, three, three classes that you managed to unlock through str through um, stretch goals. Yeah. Um, I can't really say too much about them at this point, just because I kind of had them planned originally, and like the game's changed a lot since I kind of made the decision about what classes I wanted to have in and what classes that. I kind of needed to tinker with a little bit more, but there's um, there's a Yambushi, which is kind of like another another kind of spellcaster class, uh, Kensei, which is another kind of melee class, mm -hmm. and then another one that I'm still kind of figuring out the finer details of. I mean, obviously, Ken Kensei, you know, good, the good old sword saint. Um, yeah. And Yamabushi, the the translation for Yamabushi tends to be something around along the lines of Mountain Man. Um, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes they're used to refer to um, monks that ha that tend to spend more time in more mountainous regions and tend to be a lot more well built than than the monks that you would see in in um clo a bit closer to cities. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Again, like I'm still not kind of sure how I, how I want to make it. I don't want to, I basically don't want the Yamabushi to be just like either another Omiyoji or another drunken monk. I want it to be distinct in its own way and kind of really feed off that mountain aspect and that kind of like if if in Kagino Shima the um the world itself is covered in this eclipse and it's quite dark, I think like the Yamabushi would be almost like 
separate and away from that so i, I just kind of need to figure out how to work that in, in its own kind of unique way mm-hmm. uh, there there are there are a few um yokai that i'm cu- i'm curious if if you have plans on pu- on on putting them in some of some of them okay. are going to be a bit obvious but some but some of them i'm cu- i'm just a bit curious on the matter one of them is the kamai tachi uh no uh the we don't have that one in there what is that one um kamai tachi are ca- are are they they end up looking like weasels with with sickles for for on their limbs um they tend to they tend to be associated with with things like dust devils okay uh and and is and sometimes appear as the, as this kind of cutting wind that's cool oh. uh, i like this like the sound of that mm-hmm. um I suppose one of the one of the more classic ones that ever that everybody knows about to some on um, some form is the Yuki Ona. Yes, that we do have that in there, yeah. Um There is So she's kind of she's we we had um two scenarios kind of thought out for to be like the the scenario in the back of the book and we ultimately went with the the jungle scenario Uh, but the other one was based around um our winter queen which is kind of like has aspects of yuki oni but the yuki oni is a a yokai in its own right in the book Mm -hmm. um now the the another one that i'm another one that i'm thinking of has two names but but they tend they tend to be Somewhat consistent with his appearance, and that is the um, Ushioni, also known as the Gyuki. Yuki. Yeah. Um, I will. I will type. I will type in. Oh, it's, I see. Um, um, it ten. They. The appearance, yes. the appearance can can kind of differ. Sometimes you have them look look having an ox head and a, and a spider's body. It's a, it's a it's a really interesting design, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh. I like the look of it. We've got something similar. We've got the uh, Umi Bozu, mm-hmm. which is kind of like a. It doesn't have like the the eight tentacles that the Gyuki has, but it's. Um, I don't know if you know about Umi Bozu. It's kind of like this large black creature that com- comes out of the sea yeah um i know i know it would be a bit obvious but up uh, but you probably have oni within within it yes yeah we do yeah oh. um our, our version of the oni is i, I don't know it, it might might be different than people expect but um like the artwork we've got is kind of like probably a little bit different than people might expect and and he is uh we've we've run him in a few different playtest sessions and he's certainly a, a force to be reckoned with mm-hmm. well only are only are what are what's going to come to mind when it comes to just mythological shit wreckers yeah 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 he definitely uh looks like a shit wrecker in the artwork i'll say that mm-hmm. um what about tengu Tengu, we've got in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm running a a live play on Monday, which will certainly feature some Tengu. Um, obviously, a lot of these these kind of creatures, like you say, are, are probably a little bit obvious. But the way they're kind of presented in the book is is it tries to stay as true to possible as the the folklore. So they they're not like just. Um, kind of bird people i don't know if you've seen 47 rose and ronin but the, the way they were depicted in that was um a little bit strange but they're like they're more like mischievous um hmm. mischievous and playful but like you you don't want to get on the wrong side of one because they're very fast and and obviously um quite proficient in like combat and stuff like that yeah 
there's there's plenty there's plenty of stories of, so, of somebody learning advanced swordsmanship through through tutel, by tutelage of either a tenku or ten, tengu or a um, kenku. Yeah, yeah. In pl in plenty of stories. Um, speaking speaking of that, I did get a kick out of the out of some some of the names that I saw in, in the inspiration image on the Kickstarter page. Um, some of them were mm -hmm. were pre were pretty obvious. Um, yeah. But then there then there's entries like um like Vagabond, which is of the of the um of the big four when it when it comes to when it comes to seinen manga, that's the only one that hasn't gotten a um, animated adaptation, and I think part of the reason no, for that yet. is is um it is that st that style would be hard to replicate in animation. Um, it, it, yeah. it's, I'd say that I'd say that's the main reason why there, why there's always been some big asterisk with every attempt to do animation when it comes to Berserk. Uh, yeah, I mean, we. I don't know what your kind of experience with Berserk is, but I don't think anyone was particularly happy with the the CGI animation. No, While it was nice no. to see some, um, nice to see that it was attempted. It just wasn't a very faithful or well palatable. I recreation. found out that the director behind behind that 2016 attempt. His yeah. be his background before that was mostly in slice of life anime. He was completely out of his depth. <laughs> and they gave him like one of the greatest mangas ever to to adapt. But not only that, but with with Miura's art style, it is very very detailed. Um, the ninety seven anime got around this by doing a whole lot of um a whole lot of stills and a whole lot of cheating. As not as yeah, you do yeah, with, yeah. as you do with '90s anime, go go back and look at some of the stuff that came out of the '90s. You will see a lot of cheating. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I did I did get a kick out of see, out of seeing Blade of the Immortal because, um, that it because I I say for I say for a lot of people, Blade of the Immortal through the through its publication through Dark Horse was the was a gateway drug. Oh. Especially, especially, I, I would tend to agree. Yeah, yeah. It did get it did get an anime adaptation, but I didn't watch it because of who because of who did it, and I knew and I knew that there's no way they could have done it properly. That would and the animation studio was B Train, who I, I haven't watched it either. I know they did, didn't they do a, um, a live action film as well. Now the the live action too, film um, yeah. I haven't seen yet, but I'm more willing to watch that because of who did that. That w that was ha okay. <laughs> that was handled by the by a, by um by Takashi Miike, who is a very interesting case where sometimes he will do pretty standard looking stuff, and then he decides to go completely nuts sometimes. Like yeah, didn't he do um? Thirteen assassins. Thirteen as well. I think. Thirteen assassins. Um, Sukiyaki Western Django, where he had a bunch of Japanese actors speaking, in trying to speak English, while doing this set, <laughs> while doing this samurai spin on the on the tale on um, both the tale of Genji and the War of the Roses at the same time, while mixing while mixing in old West things and a random ass cameo by <laughs> by T by Tarantino because the two of them are friends. I, that that makes sense that Tarantino would be friends with him, yeah. Um, and I did. I also I also have to give I have to give props for the presence of Tenshu because that is with with this with this rise when it comes to stealth games, Tenshu has always been one that's been unique because a lot of the stuff that people rely on with with stealth games isn't present there. Um, chiefly yeah. any sort of race. I, I remember playing. Um, I remember playing Wrath of Haven when I was younger, and like, it just blew me mind. <laughs> I remember. I can't remember how old I was. I must have been like ten, eleven. Um, but like some of the stuff you could do, and like, obviously, Metal Gear Solid had come out around that time and stuff like that. So stealth stealth games were 
kind of popular, but I remember Tenchu just having some of like the most wild shit. Wrath of Heaven, I think that was the third game. That was the one on that was the one on PS2. Yeah, 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 yeah. It already had a couple of games on the, on the PS on the PS1 by then. But the but the fact is, th because of how that game is set up, you can't re you can't really rely on a you don't really have a radar. You just have um, key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I w now one of the big things that that is brought up on the Kickstarter page is the parrying system. Um, how exactly mm -hmm. is par how exactly is parrying working in Ronin specifically? Uh, so once per combat, you can make a more difficult test than a defense, mm -hmm. and if you are successful, you get to repost and deal your damage to. Uh, an opponent, and it becomes this kind of it's it's a, a kind of like interesting thing that the players have had to manage, especially when I've run sessions, because it's like okay, you, you know, you get an opportunity to parry and, and kind of find an opening and do some repost damage, but it's kind of when you want to blow your load and use it, it's kind of like, do I use it now straight away and kind of not have it if things go south, or do I kind of conserve it and kind of wait for the right moment to use it and and generally when people have waited for the right moment and it's it's worked mm. um it's it's been it's been kind of like a, an epic moment in the combats we've had yeah and when it comes now when it comes when it comes to the I think one of I think one of the big curiosities is have you have you ever run Ronin in, in playtesting as a kind of hex crawl? Uh not yet, although the scenario is the scenario in the book is a little bit similar to a hex crawl. It's um it's laid out in these kind of like you get taken to the jungle and then you have a kind of temple that you're kind of trying to get to, but because it's because of the jungle setting and you, you've got no kind of way of knowing where you're going, you're kind of given these options of paths and stuff like that. So it's not like an out-and-out hex crawl, but it's kind of similar. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it would work as a hex crawl for sure, though. Yeah, and I am cur I'm curious on how on, on how seppuku ends up working when it comes to the when it comes to the honor system. It it definitely sounds like you're like you're having the expectation that people are going to go through multiple characters over the course of a campaign. Yeah, hundred percent. Sometimes, like it, I've run sessions where some players have gone through like two characters in a session. Um, Sapuku is there as kind of like, say you've got low honor, um, and it ranges from like one to twenty. Mm -hmm. And your class kind of dictates how much of a bonus or negative you get when you roll for your honor at the start. Like the very first character you make, you will just roll the straight roll. Um, but with the honor affecting your next character, Sapuku kind of gives you a chance to go, okay, my honor's quite low here. I'll attempt to commit Sapuku. And it is quite difficult. You have to pass a, a kind of regular ish spirit test and then quite a, a little bit more of a difficult um, resilience test to actually kind of disembowel yourself mm -hmm. um, if you are successful in the, the strangest sense of the word successful um, you would be sent down to Yomi where Yomi is a thing where whenever a character dies for the first time they are sent down to Yomi and they have kind of like a, a, a mini boss battle that they have to kind of overcome um, if you are successful and you overcome, you come back and you tick off your little resurrection tech, uh, tick box and you're free to carry on playing that character. Obviously, if you commit seppuku, your honor will be... You get, you get bonuses to honor for for the seppuku and for beating the, the guy in Yomi. Mm -hmm. If to say you were unsuccessful in Yomi, uh, but you're successful in your seppuku, at least you kind of died with honor in Yomi. And then the next character you roll up will have a plus one to every roll of the of each individual stat. 
Mm -hmm. And be now we j we had joked we had joked about um about the about the lawful stupid thing, and I'm gu I'm guessing that because of the way the tenants are written, they're they're not they're they're written as as something that's open to interpretation. Am yes, hundred percent. Um, yeah. Uh, so the tenants in the book are kind of you, they're, they're they're listed in kind of like one word within like a short description. Mm -hmm. um, but on your character sheet, you will just have those kind of one word prompts, and they're kind of open for your interpretation as you play, but also like. It almost becomes like this um, this group chat thing when you play, and if someone kind of makes a misstep that might be against their tenants, someone, the GM, usually would go, oh, don't you have a tenant that says, you know, mercy or, or, or does cares not about um, materialistic belongings? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes this kind of discussion of, oh, well, you know, in this scenario or this situation. Like, I, I was playing a character a few weeks ago <laughs> where I was supposed to be... Um, I think it was an Omioji, and I had to care for like balance and mercy and stuff. But it it came to this situation where I got taken to a doctor because I was hemorrhaging, and I had to threaten the doctor to save me life. But then I ended up losing loads of honor for doing it. So it was this kind of like it becomes this kind of balance and act of like, well, I want my character to survive, but I have to. I'm going to take a hit on my honor to do so. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in with that in mind, um, I did see that I did see that you had put in lots of fucking tables onto onto the thing. Um, one one particular one particular table that I'm that I feel like I feel like I have to ask about is um, critical injuries. Uh, yeah. You know what? I'll, I'll let me pull the the playtest materials up, and I'll, I'll give you some of the critical injuries. And obviously, we can't, um, obviously we can't go into ev into every one of them. But no, no, there, there's there's a good few. But what would what would trigger a critical injury is my main question. Um, that is kind of. There are scenarios where it says roll on the critical injury table. One of them being if you fail your seppuku. <laughs> so um, try to be sure to, to be successful when performing su seppuku. Mm -hmm. But um, it's kind of like it's, we've kind of left left it a little bit of it up to the GM. But it's kind of written in the book like if you take a certain amount of damage or a certain kind of there's crit rolls and stuff that that will affect it, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of up to the GM if it's like, you know, say an enemy crits and they deal a lot of damage, you can go right roll on the critical injury table. Yeah, and when it comes to now, with that in, with that in mind, um, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to um. The set when it comes to the setting itself, um, yeah. I'm guessing that you're going to go with a gazette gazetteer like approach regarding the regarding the setting of Kage no Shima. Uh, what do you mean? Um, where di different areas have have a few bullet po have a few bullet points, but but it's not excessively detailed. Um. Yeah. So there's kind of. In the world building section of the book, we've got kind of like a list of locations that are prominent in Kaginoshima, and then kind of like a list of of the the prominent factions as well. Um, it's not as kind of like shorthand as bullet points, but it's it's no more than like a page per kind of location. It's only like a paragraph or two per location just kind of giving some flavor of that location and the kind of factions that may inhabit it and then it's kind of the kind of seeds are there for for people to 
understand what Kage no Shima is and then they can kind of make it what they want, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. that, cer that certainly makes sense. Now, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the book? Uh, at the moment, it's around 120 pages, give or take. Uh, I think with the new classes, it'll just be over, just, just over 120 pages. Mm -hmm. And as far as the release window, are you sh are, I know it says October, but are you sh but um, how, f how far would you say the, te the text is at this point, um, stretch goals notwithstanding? 100% uh, done. It's um, the text. There, there is a version of the book which is text only, which is pretty much it's 100 percent finished. But obviously, there's a few things that are, are being tweaked in play testing, and then, like you say, there'll be some things that are added, um, mm -hmm. added considering the the stretch goals we've unlocked. But yeah, the the, the text is 100 percent done. Um, after the Kickstarter finishes, there'll be a um, playtest version of the game that will be released we're just kind of working on the the kind of format and fonts for that mm -hmm. um because we want it to to i know it's just a playtest materials but we want it to have the same kind of look and feel as the the final book will have um and then the layout and the design of around 15 to 20 percent of the book is finished so it's just a case of getting the the rest of the artwork and, and laying out the, the pages before it's time to print in October. And I know some people have kind of said that October might be a little bit ambitious for printing. Um, it is our first project of slightly reckless, reckless games. So we're not as experienced with printers as we'd like to be, but there's kind of no doubt in, in our minds that the, the PDF version will be ready before October. And then, it's just a case of how long it takes to print. We've kind of, the way the Kickstarter has gone, we'd initially had planned to print in the UK and then use a fulfillment partner in the UK, which has already been kind of decided and we've, we've kind of spoke to those people. But the Kickstarter has been very popular in the US. Mm -hmm. So I think like over 50% over of the backers are based in the US. So I'm kind of looking into getting it getting versions of the book printed over there by the same printer who's got locations in the uk and and in the us and then kind of finding a fulfillment partner over there and and shipping it out that way just to keep shipping costs down for the the american backers which mm -hmm. i don't know I, I spoke to the printer yesterday about it and, and they said it might be a little bit more money to kind of print in two different locations and send them out like that but um i just think it makes sense for for the majority of US backers for the shipping not to cost, you know, upwards of ten, fifteen dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can I can certainly get behind that. But yeah. yeah. With all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure to come on. And Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around yeah, here... Yeah, I'd love to come back. Um, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>